Hey Planeswalkers, this is Eric again from Bane Alley Magic bringing you another Commander Deck Tech video. And today we are revisiting my partner Commander Deck, Ikra Shadiki and Thrasios Triton Hero. So Ikra Shadiki, the Usurper, is 3, a green, and a black for a 3-7 Naga Wizard with Menace. That says, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you gain life equal to that creature's toughness. Thrasios Triton Hero is a green and a blue for a Merfolk Wizard, which is a 1-3, and it says you can pay 4 and scry 1, then reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, otherwise draw a card. So what I find really interesting is that hardly anyone plays this combination of partner commanders. If you look for other Thrasios Ikroshiriki deck tech videos on YouTube, you will literally find none. Like, there is none. There's mine, and there's... that's it. There are plenty of deck techs that are about Thrasios, and there are plenty of partner decks that use Ikrishidiki, but apparently there's almost no one that uses both of them together, so that just blows my mind. I mean, just look at the art. It's as though they are reaching out to one another. And what's with that bowl of fruit on Ikra's art? I mean... I understand the bowl of fruit on Tassiger's art, but Ikra is like a Naga, a snake woman. Snakes don't eat bananas. No, obviously she bought this bowl of fruit for Thrasios, who's a vegetarian and who hardly gets to eat any bananas because he lives under the sea. And it's like they are more than partners. They are friends. Yeah. Anyway, so Thrasios is great early and mid-game for drawing cards and ramping. Ikra is great for later in the game for gaining back some life and stabilizing so we can finish off the opponents. Ikra works especially great in a deck like this that runs lots of big creatures. So just as before, this deck is called Spooky Monsters because the main idea is to get stompy with gigantic terrifying creatures. So we've got a giant, a kraken, a huge octopus, a hydra, a dinosaur, a bear, that sort of thing. And of course we've got some of the scariest creatures in magic, the Eldrazi. Again, the strategy with this deck is to go tall as opposed to going wide. Going tall is something that is normally hard to pull off in Commander, but that's why we have lots of ramp, some ways to cheat big creatures out for free, and of course, there's an infinite combo. So before we begin, let's check some of the numbers. So, we've got 30 creatures in the deck, including the commanders, and 10 bomb monsters. 10 huge spooky monsters. So in total, we got 30 creatures. Uh, there's 23 ramp spells, including Thrasios, and that's just a crazy amount of ramp, but... I mean, we, we are running uh, big spooky creatures. There's definitely a lot of ramp in this deck. Uh, next, we have 14 card advantage spells, including Thrasios. There's 14 removal spells, two tutors, two counter spells, and 39 lands. So without further ado, let's get into the deck. All right, so starting off with the creatures, we have Birds of Paradise, which is one green for a 0-1 flying bird that can tap to add one mana of any color to our mana pool. So one of our five one-drops in the deck. Next we have Sylvan Caryatid, one in a green for a 0-3 plant with Defender and Hexproof, and it can tap to add one mana of any color to our mana pool. Uh, this Sylvan Caryatid is probably the best mana dork in the whole deck, even more than Birds of Paradise, just because it's hexproof and it's got three toughness so it can survive longer than the other mana dorks. Next we have Destiny Spinner, one in a green for a 2-3 human that says creatures and enchantment spells you control can't be countered. And you can pay three in a green and target land you control becomes an XX elemental creature with trample and haste until end of turn, where X is the number of enchantments you control, it's still a land. So uh, this can turn one of our lands into a big elemental creature. Uh, but this is mostly in the deck to make it so our creatures and enchantments can't be countered. Next we have Rishkar, Pima Renegade, 2 and a green for a 2-2 legendary elf druid. When it enters the battlefield, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each of up to 2 creatures. And each creature you control with any kind of counter on it has tapped to add 1 green mana to our mana pool. So, 
when this comes out, uh, you can always choose Brishkar himself, of course, to put the counter on. Uh, just turning other creatures into mono dorks is exactly what we want in this deck. We want to be able to ramp as much as possible. Next, we have Nissa Vastwood Seer, two and a green for a 2 2 elf scout. When Nissa Vastwood Seer enters the battlefield, you get to search for a basic forest and put it into your hand and then shuffle your library. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, if you control seven or more lands, you exile Nyssa, then return her to the battlefield transformed under her owner's control. And she transforms into Nyssa Sage Animist, which is a planeswalker with three loyalty counters. Plus one, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, put it into your hand, so similar to Thrasios' activated ability. Minus two, put a legendary 4-4 green elemental creature token named Ashaya the Awoken World onto the battlefield. And minus seven, untap up to six target lands. They become 6-6 six, six elemental creatures, and they're still lands. Uh, this is mostly in the deck, honestly, just for the ability to search for the forest and put it into our hand, and then eventually get some card advantage off of the plus one ability here. Um, we hardly ever do the minus two, but if we get there, I'll definitely do the minus seven and get 36 power on the battlefield. Uh, yeah, six, six sixes, that's 36 power on the battlefield. That's pretty sweet. Next, we have Thassa, God of the Sea, two and a blue for a 5-5 god, which is indestructible. As long as your devotion to blue is less than five, Thassa isn't a creature. At the beginning of your upkeep, scry one, and for one and a blue, target creature you control can't be blocked this turn. So not only is this a nice indestructible 5-5 some of the time, uh, but being able to scry one at the beginning of every single turn is just great advantage. Uh, it's def just great for fixing your deck, making sure you're getting the cards that you want. Uh, I love being able to scry one at the beginning of every single turn. It's not exactly card draw, but I'd say it's card advantage in that you're making sure that the cards you draw are better than the cards you would have drawn without scrying. Anyway, and then of course the ability to make one of your creatures unblockable is really important, especially in a big in a deck like this, which has big creatures and want to get in for tons of damage, unblockable, and maybe gain us some life with Ikir Shadiki. Next is Eternal Witness, 1 and 2 green for a 2-1 human shaman. When it enters the battlefield, you may return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, pretty much a staple in any green deck and I say this a lot uh, sometimes more than I should that this should go in any deck but eternal witness uh, should definitely go in any green deck <laughs> absolutely next is solemn simulacrum four mana for a 2-2 artifact creature when it enters the battlefield you may search your library for a basic land card and put it on the battlefield tapped and when it dies you get to draw a card uh, so this is in here just because, uh, you know, I wanted more creatures that ramped, and I also wanted something that draw. Uh, you know, of course we have green, so you might say we have better options than this for ramp, but I think it's still a great deal, even in green, to both be able to draw a card and ramp and get a 2-2 body. Next we have Beast Whisperer, 2 and 2 green for a 2-3 Elf Druid. Whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. So we've got 30 creature spells in this deck, including our commanders. Every time we cast any one of them, we're going to be drawing a card. Pretty sweet deal. Next we have Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma. Three in a green for a 4-3 bear. It says creature spells you cast with power 4 or greater cost 2 less to cast. Whenever Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma attacks, each creature you control with power 4 or greater gets plus 1 plus 1 and gains trample until the end of the turn. So that includes Goreclaw herself. She will give herself plus 1 plus 1 and trample. Uh, and yeah, it just ramps all of our big creature spells, which we are slowly getting to here. Next is Champion of Ronus, 3 and a green for a 3-3 Jackal Warrior. You may exert Champion of Ronus as it attacks. When you do, you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. So this is one of our ways, like I said, of just straight cheating out a creature from our hand right on the battlefield, no matter what the mana cost is. All we have to do is attack with Champion of Ronus and exert it, and we get that creature on the battlefield for free. Next is Lay Weaver, 3 and a green for a 2-2 human druid that you can tap to untap two target lands and this is part of our infinite combo so 
Lay Weaver works with Freed from the Real, which is an enchantment aura that uh, says you can pay a blue to tap the enchanted creature or you can pay a blue to untap the enchanted creature. So what you do is you enchant Lay Weaver with Freed from the Real and then you can tap her to untap two target lands, let's say an island and a forest, and then you use uh, then you tap those lands for the mana, so you got a green and blue floating. Then you use the blue to untap Lay Weaver with Freed from the Real, and then you tap her again to untap those two lands again, and then you've just netted one green mana. And so as long as you've got two blue lands and one land of each of your other colors, you can make infinite mana in any combinations of color with Lay Weaver and Freed from the Real. Um, of course, you can't have both of these on the battlefield if you didn't have a blue or green mana source. So you can at least make infinite mana of one color with this. Um, but as long as you got all your land types and you got two blue, because you always need to use one of the blue to untap her again, right? Um, you can have infinite mana in any combination of colors here. And then what we do with that infinite mana is we dump it into Thrasios. With infinite mana and Thrasios, we can use his ability an infinite amount of times and basically draw our entire deck and put all the lands from our deck onto the battlefield tapped. And so we also still have infinite mana, so not only can we draw all the cards from our deck, but we can also cast every spell in our entire deck. We also get the same effect with Eryxmethy's Slumbering Isle if we don't have um, Lay Weaver, we can enchant Eryxmethy's with Freed from the Real, so Eryxmethes is two, a green and a blue for a 12-12 Kraken. When it enters the battlefield, it enters with five slumber counters on it. And as long as it has a slumber counter on it, it's a land, it's not a creature. And whenever you cast a spell, you may remove a slumber counter from Eryxmethes, and finally it taps to add both blue and a green. That's the most important part. So if you enchant Eryxmethes with Freed from the Real, you tap Eryxmethes to make blue and green, you use the blue to untap them. You tap Eryxmethes to make blue and green, you use the blue to untap them. So that'll produce infinite green mana only. But that's all you need for Thrasios to draw the entire deck, and it'll let you still cast a majority of the big spooky monsters, because a lot of them are all drowsy. They don't care what color mana we have. So that's our infinite combo, either Eryxmethes or Lay Weaver with Freed from the Real, and Thrasios Triton Hero lets us draw our entire deck and cast all of our creatures. The only thing is, um, I don't really have any way to give all of our creatures haste. Uh, not that that would be difficult to do, but I just felt like, you know, I wanted it to be not exactly just an instant game winning infinite combo. I wanted it to be, all right, you guys got one more chance, right? You got one more turn, and then all my creatures are going to attack next turn. And of course, if I have infinite mana and all my cards in my hand, I have all the counter spells I need to make sure that they can't do anything anyway. But I, uh, yeah, I don't necessarily have a way to give them haste, but if you want to make it an instant game winning kill, just go ahead and give all your creatures haste somehow. Alright, so next we have Acidic Slime, 3 and 2 green for a 2-2 Death Touch Ooze. When it enters the battlefield, destroy target artifact, enchantment, or land. Uh, this is just another staple for any green deck. It gives you a 2-2 Death Touch blocker, which is going to prevent a lot of combat damage coming your way. And uh, yeah, it's removal. Destroy target non-land permanent, essentially, or non-creature permanent, essentially. Next we have Thrix, the Sudden Storm, 3 and 2 blue for a 4-5 elemental giant with flash and flying. And it says spells you cast with converted mana cost 5 or greater cost 1 less to cast and can't be countered. Flash is great at protecting Thrix. If we cast Thrix on the end step of the turn before ours, there's a lot more of a chance that we're going to be able to use him right away. Uh, instead of just casting him on our normal main phase and then having to wait a turn around the table, uh, uh, Flash gives us more of an opportunity to attack with the creature, and just uh, waiting is going to help him avoid removal. So uh, Thrix is really great in this deck, just making our big spells less to cast and so that, that they can't be countered. I mean, this is just fabulous. It's really rare to find Ramp in blue, and so I think Thrix is really unique in that respect. Uh, it's also just perfect for our giant spooky monsters deck, making sure that all of our spooky monsters can't be countered. Excellent creature. 
Next we have Krufix, God of Horizons. Three, a green and a blue for a 4-7 god with indestructible. As long as your devotion to green and blue is less than seven, Krufix isn't a creature. You have no maximum hand size, and if you would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes colorless instead. So normally, mana empties from your mana pool at the end of every phase and turn. But with Krufix, you just save all that mana and it just becomes colorless mana instead. Which is really great for casting our Eldrazi in the deck and just ramping in general, just storing a bunch of ramp. Uh, especially great if you have ways to untap all your creatures every turn. Uh, we don't really have that in this deck, but you don't really even need that to make Krufix an awesome ramp creature. Next we have Uvenwald Hydra, 4 and 2 green for a star star Hydra with reach. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control, and when it enters the battlefield, you get to search for any land and put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. So it gets you any land you want onto the battlefield, it doesn't have to enter tapped, and yeah, just a big reach creature. Really great for any big creature deck as ramp. Next we have Prime Speaker Zagana, two, two green and two blue for a 1-1 one, one merfolk wizard. Prime Speaker Zagana enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is the greatest power among other creatures you control. When Prime Speaker Zagana enters the battlefield, draw cards equal to its power. So let's say you had Ikra Shidiki and Thrasios Triton Hero on the battlefield, and then you cast Prime Speaker Zagana. At that point, the creature with the greatest power would be Shadiki with three, so Prime Speaker Zagana would get three plus one plus one counters, and therefore you would draw four cards, because you would have a power of four at that point. I'd say it's actually a staple for any Simic deck. A uh, really great commander for any Simic deck, just draws you a ton of cards. Next we have Consecrated Sphinx, four and two blue for a four six Sphinx with flying. And it says, whenever an opponent draws a card, you may draw two cards. Yeah, yeah. This is, of course, one of the most busted blue cards in the entire game. One of the best ways to draw cards in the entire game. And it's just so spooky looking. Look at that face. This is sort of this first of our spooky monsters here. Uh, really creepy face for a sphinx. Moving on to our scary monsters, we have Massacre Worm, 3 and 3 black for a 6-5 worm. When it enters the battlefield, creatures your opponents control get minus 2, minus 2 until end of turn. And whenever a creature an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, that player loses 2 life. So not only is this a board wipe, but this is also an awesome way to drain your opponents of a ton of life. Next we have Hornet Queen, 4 and 3 green for a 2-2 two, two flying death touch insect. When it enters the battlefield, put 4 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch onto the battlefield. So um, this is not necessarily a big beater, but this is just fabulous for defense. You know, awesome defensive card. Being able to have 5 death touch flying bodies on the battlefield, you can't beat that for defense. Next we have Nezahal, Primal Tide, 5 and 2 blue for a 7-7 seven, seven Elder Dinosaur. Nezahal can't be countered. You have no maximum hand size. Whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, draw a card. And finally, you can discard 3 cards to exile Nezahal, and then return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. So, Nezahal has a lot of text, lots of abilities. Most important being whenever an opponent casts a non-creature spell, draw a card. Nezahal is going to draw you a ton of cards. It's not like Mystic Remora or Ristic Study where they can choose to pay mana to prevent you from drawing the card. It's like, no, you just get to draw a card every single time an opponent casts a non-creature spell. Also, uh, having no maximum hand size is really important. And Nezahal protects itself uh, by being able to discard three cards. Uh, you can protect it from removal or board wipes or anything, right? And also Nezahal draws you more cards, giving you more of, an, more of a chance of being able to use the last ability. So Nezahal's a fabulous mono blue card, great for a mono blue commander also. Next is Lorthos, the Tidemaker. 5 and 3 blue for an 8-8 eight, eight octopus. Whenever it attacks, you may pay 8. If you do, tap up to 8 target permanents. Those permanents don't untap during their controller's next untap step. So Lorthos is actually the original commander of this deck when it was a mono blue huge monsters deck. 
such a great card if you can get the mana for it. Of course, it's a lot of mana, right? You gotta pay eight just to cast it and eight to use its ability. But if you do that, I mean, you are just shutting someone out of the game. You can tap down eight of their lands and those lands won't untap during their next untap step. Lorthos is just the perfect representation of what this deck is all about. Just huge, scary monsters. And that brings us to the Eldrazi. Kozilek, Butcher of Truth, 10 mana for a 12-12 Eldrazi. When you cast this spell, draw 4 cards. It has Annihilator 4, so whenever this creature attacks, defending player sacrifices 4 permanents. And when Kozilek, Butcher of Truth, is put into a graveyard from anywhere, its owner shuffles their graveyard into their library. So, this card is just fabulous. It's a 12-12 with Annihilator 4. It draws you cards, and it prevents you from getting milled out, right? If anyone's playing that mill deck, uh, Eldrazi like this are going to 100% protect you and make sure that you never mill out because they're going to just keep shuffling your graveyard back into your library. Next is Kozilek the Great Distortion, 8 and 2 diamonds for a 12-12 Eldrazi. When you cast Kozilek the Great Distortion, if you have fewer than 7 cards in hand, you can draw cards equal to the difference. And it has Menace, and you can discard a card with converted mana cost X to counter target spell with converted mana cost X. So again here we got a 12-12 beater, this time it's got Menace, it's again drawing us cards, and Kozilek the Great Distortion turns every single card into our, in our hand into a, a counter spell. So even our lands can be discarded to counter a spell with converted mana cost zero. So a really unique ability being able to turn our entire hand into counter spells and just a huge beast. Next is Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, 10 mana for a 10-10 Eldrazi. When you cast Ulamog Ceaseless Hunger, you exile two target permanents. It has Indestructible, and whenever Ulamog attacks, defending player exiles the top 20 cards of his or her library. So, this is a way we can milk, and uh, also just great for removal. Exiling two target permanents on cast, and again, that's not on entering the battlefield. So as soon as you cast this, that trigger goes on the stack, and you get to exile up to two target permanents. Really sweet. Next is Ulamog the Infinite Gyre, 11 mana for a 10-10. When you cast Ulamog the Infinite Gyre, destroy target permanent. It's indestructible. It has Annihilator 4, and when Ulamog is put into a graveyard from anywhere, its owner shuffles his or her graveyard into his or her library. So another huge, awesome beater with Annihilator and destroying any permanent we want on cast. And our last Eldrazi is Emrakul, the Promised End, 13 mana for a 13-13, but it costs one less to cast for each card type among cards in your graveyard. And when you cast Emrakul, gain control of target opponent during that player's next turn. After that turn, that player takes an extra turn. And this has Flying, Trample, and Protection from Instance. So, a 13-13 with Flying and Trample is good enough. Um, but it also costs less for cards in our graveyard and it lets us control someone during their next turn. It's pretty awesome. Next we have Soul Ring. This is the start of our ramp. Next is Growing Rites of Itlamok. Two and a green for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a creature card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. At the beginning of your end step, if you control four or more creatures, you transform Growing Rites of Itlamok into Itlamok Cradle of the Sun, which is basically a Gaia's Cradle, but a little better. Uh, so it taps to add a green mana to our mana pool, or we can tap it to add green mana for each creature we control. So this can end up adding a ton of mana to our mana pool if we've got enough creatures. Next is Cultivate. Two and a green for a sorcery. Search your library for up to two basic lands. Reveal those cards and put one onto the battlefield tapped and the other into your hand, and then shuffle your library. The important thing to remember here that uh, a lot of new players forget is that if you haven't already played a land for turn, you can play that card that you put into your hand as your land for turn. So you can basically get both of these lands onto the battlefield if you haven't already played your land for turn. Next is Chromatic Lantern, three mana 
for an artifact that taps to add one mana of any color to our mana pool and it says lands we control tap to add one mana of any color to our mana pool so it's just this ramp and mana fixing right being able to make it so all of our lands tap for whatever color we want next is Thran Dynamo four mana for an artifact that taps for three mana pretty sweet Next is Dictate of Karametra, 3 and 2 green for an enchantment with Flash. And it says whenever a player taps a land for mana, that player adds 1 mana to his or her mana pool of any type that land produced. So, uh, this is great ramp, and uh, even though it is uh, something that affects the whole table, it's great that it has Flash. So you can use this on, you can Flash this in on the turn right before your turn, so you're the first person who gets to take advantage of it. Next is Zendikar Resurgent, 5 and 2 black for an enchantment. Whenever you tap a land for mana, add 1 mana to your mana pool of any type that land produced. And whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. So both ramp and card draw on one card. Great card there. Next is our draw card spell, starting with Preordain. Scry 2 and then draw a card for 1 blue. Uh, this is pretty great early game. If you play this on turn 1, it's a really great way to set yourself up. Next we have Hunter's Insight, 2 and a green for an instant. Choose target creature you control whenever that creature deals combat damage to a player or planeswalker this turn, draw that many cards. So basically, drawing cards equal to the amount of damage your creature deals to target player or planeswalker this turn. This can draw you a ton of cards for just 3 mana. Next, next is Ristic Study, 2 and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent plays a spell, you may draw a card unless that pay player pays 1. So you do have to constantly remind everyone, hey, you're going to pay one for that, you're going to pay one for that. If you don't, I get to draw a card. Uh, but this can draw you a lot of cards. Next is Phyrexian Arena. One and two black for an enchantment. It says at the beginning of your upkeep, you draw a card and lose one life. So especially being that we're in a format that where we start with 40 life, this is a great deal. Um, it's pretty rare that this is going to deal you 40 damage and kill you. I mean, even if it is dealing you 40 damage at that point, it's drawn you 40 cards, so, you know, you should have some way to gain some life back at that point. <laughs> uh, basically, just a great draw card spell. If you can get this out early, you're definitely ahead of the game, just drawing an extra card every single turn. Next is Reanimate. One black for a sorcery. Put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose life equal to its converted mana cost. So, Another potential turn one play, probably more like turn two if someone like ends up discarding a big creature turn two, or maybe we do. Um, but uh, I, I just wanted to have more one drops in the deck, so I took out one expensive card draw spell and put in reanimate. I figured I needed a reanimation spell in this deck anyway. Um, but yeah, just a great deal for just one mana. Take the best creature out of any graveyard, put it under the battlefield under your control. Next we have Villainous Wealth, X, black, green, and a blue for a sorcery. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of his or her library. You may cast any number of non-land cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them without paying their mana costs. So this is one of the most fun spells to play in the deck. Just get a bunch of mana and pump it all into a Villainous Wealth, you know, and just get to cast all the spells that are revealed for free. Really great value. Next is Mana Drain, 2 blue for an instant, counter target spell, at the beginning of your next main phase add an amount of colorless mana to your mana pool equal to that spell's converted mana cost. Yeah I know, this is like the most expensive card I've ever revealed on my channel, ever, but um, I just happened to come across one, you know, I opened a booster pack, it had a Scalding Tarns, and I traded it for a Mana Drain, and I thought that was a pretty sweet deal. Uh, but yeah, would I ever actually pay $80 for this card? Probably not, but if you want to, sure, go ahead. Does really great with this deck, again, because we need lots of ramp. Next is Mystic Confluence. Three and two blue. Choose three. You may choose the same mode more than once. Counter target spell, unless its controller pays three. Return target card to its owner's hand, or draw a card. Uh, this card is so good. If you haven't put it in one of your blue decks yet, I really recommend putting it in a blue deck and trying it out. I I'm always happy to draw it every time I draw it because there's always something it can do for you. You know, it's removal, it's a counter spell, and it'll draw you a card. And no matter what, 
even if you just need to counter one spell or return one permanent to its owner's hand, you still always have that choice of drawing cards as the extra option. So there's always a choice here. There's always a choice that's good no matter what point in the game it is. So Mystic Confluence, go ahead and grab yourself one. Next is Stubborn Denial, one blue for an instant counter target non-creature spell unless its controller pays one, but it has Ferocious, so if you control a creature with power four or greater, that spell is just straight countered instead. So really great in any deck which is going stompy, which is going tall, Stubborn Denial, just one blue, counter target non-creature spell. Next is Plasm Capture, two green and two blue for an instant counter target spell. At the beginning of your next pre-combat main phase, add X mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool where X is the spell's converted mana cost. So this is another mana drain, except for it ends up giving you colored mana instead of colorless mana. Pretty sweet. Next is Sultai Charm. A black, a green, and a blue for an instant. Choose one. Destroy target mono-colored creature. Destroy target artifact or enchantment. Or draw two cards and then discard a card. So even though it looks like there's three choices, you really have four choices here because the second one is artifact or enchantment. So you get to destroy a mono-colored creature, an artifact, or an enchantment, or you get to draw two and discard two. It's always great to have cards with lots of options on them. Next is Putrefy. This is the start of our removal. One, a black and a green for an instant. Destroy target artifact or creature. It can't be regenerated. And if you've been playing Magic uh, or Commander for any good amount of time, you know there's lots of artifacts we could target with this too. Next is Oblivion Strike. Three and a black for a sorcery with Devoid, so it has no color technically. And it's, it says Exile Target Creature. Just one thing this deck might have trouble with is indestructible creatures. Next is Imprisoned in the Moon. Two and a blue for an aura. Enchant creature, land, or planeswalker. Enchanted permanent is a colorless land with tap to add one colorless mono to your mono pool and loses all other card types and abilities. So Imprisoned in the Moon is the same as Song of the Dryads. It can just totally ruin someone's commander. If you put this on someone's commander, it's going to be really hard for them to get their commander back unless they have enchantment removal. Uh, just definitely great removal for any blue deck. Next is Peer's Whim. Three and a green for a sorcery. For each player, choose friend or foe. Each friend searches their library for a land card, puts it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffles their library. Each foe sacrifices an artifact or enchantment they control. So um, this is both removal and ramp in one card. Pretty sweet. Next is Casualties of War. Two, two black, and two green for a sorcery. Choose one or more. Destroy target artifact, creature, enchantment, land, or planeswalker. So this can destroy up to five different permanents at once. Really cool spell, very flexible. Uh, I think it's better than um, Decimate because with Decimate, you have to have all the permanents on the battlefield in order for you to do it. But with Casualties of More, it just says choose one or more. So you don't have to have all of those on the battlefield in order to cast it. Next we have Aether Spouts, three and two blue for an instant. For each attacking creature, its owner puts it on the top or bottom of his or her library. So this is much better than sending the creatures back to their owner's hand. Um, this is essentially getting rid of the creature completely if they choose to put it on the bottom of their library And if they put it on the top of their library, they're just really slowing themselves down They're basically skipping their next draw step in order to get this card back or to, to get the card back to their hand So Aether Spouts is a really sweet removal spell for blue And we of course have Cyclonic Rift one in a blue for an instant return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand, but if you overload it for 7 mana, it instead becomes return each non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. So, just a fabulous removal spell. <gasps> Probably the best removal spell in the game because it's instant speed. And there's lots of tricks you can do with it. You can wait for your opponent to dump all their resources into one permanent. And then you just respond by Cyclonic Rift. Or you wait for them to attack you with their entire army, and then you respond with Cyclonic Rift. Or one of my favorite things to do is you wait till their end step, and then you Cyclonic Rift, and then they have to discard down to seven. <laughs> so they have to discard a lot of the permanents they just put back into their hand. All right, next we've got a couple ways to protect our big creatures. There's Whisper Silk Cloak, three mana for an equipment. It has equipped for two, an equipped creature is unblockable and has shroud. So 
unblockable, just really important in this deck, being able to get that combat damage in. And of course, when we have big spooky Eldrazi, we want to have ways to protect them, otherwise they might not survive one round around the table. Next is Lightning Greaves, 2 mana for an equipment with equip 0, equipped creature has haste and shroud. And then we have a few other spells. There's Triumph of the Hordes, 2 and 2 green for a sorcery until end of turn. Creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1 and gain trample and infect. So just a way to finish out the game, try to kill some opponents quickly so we can get the game over with. And next we have Increasing Ambition, 4 and a black for a sorcery. Search your library for a card and put that card into your hand. If Increasing Ambition was cast from a graveyard, instead search your library for two cards and put those cards into your hand, then shuffle your library. And it has flashback for 8, so for 7 and a black you can cast it from your graveyard and then exile it. So this is expensive as far as tutors go, but this can get you up to 3 cards, and that's a pretty sweet deal. And last we have Scheming Symmetry, one black for a sorcery, choose two target players, each of them searches their library for a card, then shuffles their library and puts that card on top of it. So sounds bad, but this card is actually really good. It's a one mana tutor, and you just gotta play it right, you just gotta politic. Number one, you can always, almost always find a player who's behind in the game, right? Someone who's been mana screwed, you know they're not going to search for anything that crazy. They're probably going to search for a land or something like that, right? So first choice is, of course, just the player who's the most behind. Choose them to search for something. Try to make an ally. Say, hey, if I let you search for something, will you not mess with me for several turns? Or another thing you can do is you just ask everyone, hey, who wants to search for something? And if you do, tell me what it is. So Scheming Symmetry, I think, is a really great tutor for just one black. And that brings us into the lands, of which we have like 39 lands or something. A lot of lands, but hey, we got a lot of big creatures too. So Temple of the False God is a land that taps to add two colorless mana to our mana pool. Activate this ability only if you control five or more lands. So a lot of more competitive players uh, laugh at this card. They hate this card. The thing is, if you're playing competitive magic, you're probably only running like 30 lands in your deck anyway, maybe even less, because they run so many mana rocks, they have so much cheap ramp, they really don't run a lot of lands in competitive EDH. But if you're playing casual commander, we're all the time running like 37 lands, 38 lands, sometimes more. And in, in those decks, Temple of the False God is awesome. I mean, I also like to think if you don't have five or more lands, then you're probably just losing the game anyway. Uh, so as long as your deck is doing what it's supposed to, you should have five or more lands, and Temple of the False God should work. Personally, I have never had Temple of the False God not work for me. It's it's always worked. Uh, so I always think it's interesting when people like literally laugh at it, like, oh, Temple of the False God, what a terrible card. I, I, I think it's a really good card. It just kind of depends on your meta, I guess. Next is Rogue's Passage land that taps to add a colorless or you can pay four and tap it and target creature can't be blocked this turn gotta get in that combat damage next is homeward path land that taps to add one colorless or you can tap it and each player gains control of all creatures he or she owns so yeah there are plenty of decks out there that want to steal your permanents and so this is especially important in a deck like ours that has lots of big permanents that our opponents can steal next is reliquary tower says you have no maximum hand size and taps for colorless. Then I have Evolving Wilds. Uh, you sacrifice it to search your library for any basic and put it on the battlefield tapped. Uh, just a nice budget way to fix your mana. Next is Tranquil Thicket, which is the first of my cycling lands. Uh, cards with cycling, you pay the cycling cost and then you can discard the card to draw a different card. And these are great on lands because sometimes you just end up with too many lands and you don't need any more. And in those situations you can cycle away the cycling lands. So Tranquil Thicket, uh, so Tranquil Thicket enters tapped, taps to add a green or you can cycle it away for one green. Lonely Sandbar is the same thing, enters tapped, taps for blue, you can cycle it for one blue. And finally, Baron Moore enters tapped, taps for black, or you can cycle it away for one black. Then we have the Bounce Lands, like Golgari Rot Farm, which enters tapped, and when it enters the battlefield, return a land you control to its owner's hand, and it taps for both black and a green. So I think these Bounce Lands are actually pretty good, because eventually in Commander, we are eventually going to miss a land drop, and so it's good to have these 
that at least make it so some of our lands tap to add two mana, uh, right? Of course, in the perfect game, you'd get every single land, and then these might not be as good, but that rarely happens in Commander. I feel like most of the time you do miss a land drop, and in those situations, these bounce lands actually do pretty good. Also, I just want to say that the uh, bounce lands work really great with the combo. You know, just being able to untap two lands. Well, if one of those lands is a land that taps for two mana, you know, you're netting even more mana that way. So next is Tainted Wood. Taps for a colorless, or you can tap it to add black or green. You can only do that if you already control a swamp. Uh, this is also just helpful for casting some of our Eldrazi that have diamonds in the casting cost. Same with Lana War Waste. Taps to add a colorless, or you can tap it for green or black. If you do, it deals one damage to you. Next is Lumbering Falls, which enters tapped. Taps to add blue or green, and you can pay four and it becomes a 3-3 green and blue elemental creature with hexproof. A little creature on a land when we need it. Also gives the land hexproof if it needed that. Next is Simic Growth Chamber. Enters tapped when it enters the battlefield. Return a land you control to its owner's hand and it taps to add both blue and green. Yavamaya Coast taps for a colorless or you can tap it for blue or green. If you do it deals you one damage. Demir Aqueduct is the last bounce land, enters tapped. When it enters, you return a land you control to its owner's hand. It taps to add blue and black. And then we have Opulent Palace, which taps to add either black, green, or blue, and it enters tapped. And that brings us to the basic lands. So six swamps, and eight islands, and nine forests. Obviously we have less swamps because there are less black mana symbols in the deck. There are mostly our green mana symbols in the deck. And that's it. That's the Thrasios Triton Hero Ikra Shidiki the Usurper deck tech. Let me know what you think. If you like this video, please hit that like or subscribe button. Leave some comments in the comment section below. This is Eric from Bane Alley Magic signing off. Until next time, take care, take it easy.